Gianfranco Ciccone, as you can tell from my <laughs> English accent, I'm actually Italian, uh, but I used to live in, in, in the UK. Uh, for the ones of you with visual impairments, I'm a 50 year old male with a beard and short curly black hair. Uh, and I'm calling from my music room. Uh, this, this is actually real, but because it is so articulated, all the musical instruments, I cannot put a background behind me, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, my background and my role in uh, Capgemini, I'm responsible for all the efforts that our colleagues put into developing and, and um, data ecosystems, particularly on the, say, more management consulting side of things. So the strategic elements, the, the vision, the design, and of course the operations and, and the element of trust that are more close to the conversation we are, are going to have today. Um, if you're not, um, let's say, uh, acquainted with uh, the uh, sustainable development goal number eight is the one that promotes uh, sustained, inclusive and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work for all. And if you know that the SDG in detail, it's quite wide. It goes from the growth element itself everything related to employability, uh, everything related to skills. Uh, there are elements of sustainable tourism, uh, and of course there are elements of um, ending modern slavery and child labor. But because of the uh, very kind guests that accept to be uh, with us today, we will focus on the employability and uh, job seeking and skills and reskilling element only. That, uh, to tell you the truth, feels quite ambitious to me already. <laughs> Uh, as it is. Uh, so don't um, uh, underestimate the commitment of that. Um, I, I used to joke that uh, data ecosystems and data sharing are actually not new at all, particularly in employment. I mean, um, raise your hand if you have ever wrote a CV. You have, right? And if, I guess even before digital networks, um, we all have to write well i'm old enough to remember when we used this to do this perhaps on paper with a nice calligraphy and so on we are all keen to share information about ourselves if we, there is something that we can gain from and of course the meeting of the needs of an employer uh, the needs of an employee or job seeker uh, to achieve some kind of uh, purpose and specifically in this case um, doing the kind of matchmaking with a a job that could work for you is a relatively traditional and old fashioned way of sharing data. Probably the difference today is, uh, and the focus of today is that uh, we were never more uh, developed in terms of the instruments uh, we have, the tools we can, that can support us, uh, whether it is from job seeking to the actual reskilling as we are in a job or finding the next job um, uh, too. And, and focusing on these topics specifically and how uh, we can at the same time manage the risks of the new technology that's still new and perhaps not well understood, but also make the best out of it that we have as panelists helping me. Uh, Andrea Risberg, uh, who is a program manager from the AI Sustainability Center. Uh, she also uh, managed the, um, the program they run for the Swedish Employment Agency uh, with relation to uh, the ethical uh, profiling um, using AI of job seekers. Uh, we have Eckhard Ernst, uh, with the chief macroeconomist at the International Labour Organization, that is uh, uh, UN agencies, and Vinigo Larea, who is talent manager director at Mondragon Corporation, one of my uh, favorite uh, companies in the world, and you, and you will understand why when he introduces himself. Um, so uh, I would ask you three, uh, first of all, thank you for being with me. I would ask you to spend five minutes each, Max, to introduce yourselves, uh, what is your role in your organization, uh, and perhaps an, an anecdote of how you found that job, since we are on topic, right? Um, and, uh, and possibly, uh, yeah, what, explain why your organization is relevant to this topic so we can get into uh, the subject. Uh, shall we start from Andrea, please? Hi everyone, um, it's great to be here. Um, so my name is Andrea Rosberg. I uh, work for a Swedish company called AI Sustainability Center. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here um, today. So at AI Sustainability Center, what we do is that we are a provider of an ethical AI governance platform, meaning uh, a platform with various tools for assessing and managing ethical risks with AI solutions. We're also an expert advisor um, to both companies, but also public sector organizations on how they can 
um, strategically work with um, responsible use of data and AI. And uh, so what I do at the company is that I manage the projects that we have with clients. Um, like I said, we work with clients in both private and public sector, um, particularly very large organizations that are looking to scale AI across their organization. And um, I think uh, I think the theme for or the theme for today's session, AI for Good, is really fitting because the way that we approach AI in general at, at AI Sustainability Center is that AI is something that can help us create exponential benefit, um, both for us as individuals, for organizations, but also for society as a whole. But um, with AI also comes exponential risks, uh, and you need to be aware of the risks and you need to be uh, making sure that you're actively um, avoiding them. Um, and we've seen a lot of examples over the last years um, where companies or public sector organizations have fallen into ethical pitfalls, um, resulting in discrimination, privacy intrusion, uh, socially exclude, excluding certain groups. And that can cause some serious harm, both reputational, but also financial. Um, so essentially, if what we do is that we help uh, companies use AI in a trustworthy way in order to achieve all of, this, uh, all of these benefits. Um, and I want to focus particularly for this session here um, on a product that we ran together with the Swedish Public Employment Services. Um, so in May 2020, um, when the COVID-19 pandemic uh, struck, um, Sweden saw a rapid increase in unemployment, as many other countries did. And um, the employment services were tasked with helping job seekers getting back to the labor market as, as quickly as possible, essentially. And um, so the process of, of uh, enrolling in the pub, uh, with the public employment services uh, look, follows, it follows a certain process where you do initially do a profiling of each individual job seeker. And then depending on that profiling, which is essentially an assessment of how far from the labor market you as a job seeker are. And depending on that, you're then offered various types of support. And um, this is something that's traditionally done manually. So they have caseworkers doing these profilings. But uh, in May 2020, there were 600,000 people unemployed in Sweden. And with the capacity they had at that point in time, they were able to pro uh, profile 500 people per month. So that creates a significant bottleneck. But using AI instead to do the same type of profiling, they can pro process um, all 600,000 people within an hour. So that opens up to whole new ways of essentially performing their assignment. But in addition to the increased efficiency, they, were, they also saw that they were able to make more accurate predictions. So um, doing this profiling requires a, a very large amount of information, both about the individual job seeker, about how the labor market functions, but also about how the labor market functions today. And um, having taking all those factors into consideration can be quite difficult for, for a human. So um, that can end up with decisions that are either biased, but also not uh, super accurate. So leveraging AI instead is a way to reduce the bias, uh, the human bias, but also a way to make decisions more accurate. And uh, that's essentially what we help them do. So we help them um, mitigate the ethical risks so that they could leverage AI in this way and then scale it across their organization. And um, I think that's, that's the essence of it all, where I'm coming from. Uh, so I see it as AI is something that we can use uh, to create a lot of good. It can help us accelerate the achievement of the sustainable development goals. But um, in order to success successfully do that, you need to make sure that you're doing it in a trustworthy way. And that goes both for how you're using data and then how you're using technology on top of that data. Thanks, Andrea. And, and don't reveal too much, otherwise it, you won't have anything <laughs> else to say later. <laughs> um, uh, and in the meantime, as you start getting to know uh, our guests, think of questions that may be relevant to the conversation and, and, and get them coming in, in the chat, please. Eckhart, would you like to go next? 
Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jean Franco, and thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation to, to be part of this. So I'm Eckhard Ernst. I'm uh, chief of the Macroeconomic Policies and Jobs Unit at the International Labour Organization, and I work specifically in the research department there on issues related to future of work, uh, not only technologies but all type of global trends that are affecting our labour markets. Whether it's climate change, you saw COP26 just uh, just finished. Uh, whether it is related to old age uh, um, dependency or, or basically aging of the population, etc. So, so I mean, looking at a really a broad range of issues and how they interact with, with each other. And I mean, the ILO is actually the custodian of the of the, uh, SDG 8. So in this sense, I think it's uh, quite naturally to, to, to be on this, on this panel for us. Uh, um, but just to give you maybe a, a broader background also from, from our sense, I mean, I think the ILO is really in essence, an ecosystem in itself, and we are talking about data uh, data ecosystems today. I think the ILO is a data. It's not a data, but it's an ecosystem in itself. We are tripartite organization, and what that means is that we don't only have government sitting at our table, but also social partners, uh, trade unions, and business associations. And we do reach out to as a, a, all type of other uh, uh, non-governmental organizations uh, like uh, EIR Sustainability Center that Andrea represents and others. To make sure that our um, advice, our policy um, uh, recommendations are kind of in line with what what is actually needed in the world of work, huh? and so so our purpose is uh, what we call social promoting social justice and decent work uh, in the world. That we have from different uh, different pillars and this uh, different policy angle. Uh, uh, obviously, decent jobs, decent work, productive employment is one of the big ones. Uh, but then uh, social promoting social protection as part of it. Uh, uh, supporting um, uh, global uh, uh, collective bargaining and, and social dialogue is, is another one, and, and in, ensuring that um, uh, labor rights are being respected is another one. And actually, on this on this particular point, as we are kind of working intensively together with uh, our uh, men, uh, our constituents in different countries uh, to ensure that, or to think about how we can actually use these um, these new data ecosystems in in order to uh, um, help countries to implement and enforce the regulation that they have. Uh, often, I mean, Gianfranco mentioned child labor and, and, uh, and informality in his opening remarks, and that's obviously something which we are very keen on as well. And here often, you know, the data that, that governments dispose of is not sufficient uh, often to, to make sure that they actually enforce their regulation. I mean, most, most governments in the world have, uh, have respect of regulation, but they're just uh, uh, it's difficult to enforce and so this kind of new data environment, if you want, is, is something that helps us a lot. Uh, just that for the, for the anecdote, uh, John Frank, you mentioned that, um, uh, that we all have filled in our series. Peter Capelli, who is a management professor at Wharton School, he, he, he has this, uh, has this anecdote saying that uh, manpower planning goes back to the, um, uh, the um, uh, US Army in the 1930s. Yeah? And so, I mean, it's like this idea that we Kind of plan ahead and how how we staff our companies and how uh, um, how bureaucracies or how institutions is something that is really old age. But just now we really have the data, the granular data, how to get it. My personal background is uh, is very different. I I got this job offline in a sense that I actually had lunch with a colleague at the OECD at the time, and she told me about the opportunity to come to Geneva. And that's how I ended up here. So I'm really kind of the counter example of, of of the data of the data strategy. So just to kind of as an anecdote behind it, and I'm looking really forward to your question and discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And the, the reference to the US Army in the 1930s, I believe, is also an oral story in a way, because it is one of the earliest demonstrations of bias in how people were selected for the military. Um, but we, let's not go down the rabbit hole too soon. Uh, Inigo, would you like to, to introduce yourself as well? And please re remind us why I like so much Monogram. Oh, thank you very much. Um, well, my name is Inigo, Inigo Larrea. I am the uh, director for talent management in Mondragon Corporation. Uh, maybe some of you may, may know it, but Mondragon, we are a, a corporation of uh, worker owned cooperatives. Huh? We are, let's say, um, a bottom up corporation in which the, uh, we have well, roughly 100 cooperative companies. Uh, that are associated uh, to Mondragon. And my role is, is, is mainly working in talent attraction and talent development right, for, the, uh, for the cooperatives. Uh, well, my, uh, my actual job uh, is not, uh, how did I get to my actual job? It's not like very, 
it's like very useful. No, it's, it's, it's something offline, like uh, Edgar said. Um, but uh, I remember my first serial job. Uh, but I can tell you that you know, I've been like uh, I've been through many many jobs. I be mean, like uh, during my students' times, I was bartender, working in a petrol station. I was an ambulance driver. I was a contract construction worker. Then I got like a research intern in the, in the university, and then. My first, let's say, serious job was uh, with an uh, international consulting company, uh, very well known. Um, and I got like three interviews, one in Bilbao, which is uh, nearby here in the Basque region area. And then uh, the second one in Madrid and the third one in Barcelona. Um, and I got my ticket paid for the, uh, for the last interview in Barcelona. And I, I remember that I lost my flight. Um, due to time uh, time change for the summer season. Um, so uh, it doesn't have to do with, um, uh, let's say, AI, but uh, with uh, organic intelligence. Uh, I was not able to, to reach the flag, even though, um, uh, let's say, fortunately, I got my job and then I, I, I move on in my, my career. No? Um, the main issue here that you, you put it is uh, why a job is or work is so important uh, uh, for us in Mondragon ecosystem. Uh, well, work for us is, is something central to our, uh, let's say, our corporation, our, our the whole philosophy of the Mondragon Corporation. Work is, uh, we are a worker-owned company, so work is the way you work through a company. I mean, it's, we, you cannot participate in Mondragon without working in it. You cannot be an investor. You, you must be we share the work. And so the work for us is uh, something about security, of course. I mean, it's, uh, we are owners, we, we talk about partners, we cannot get dismissed. Uh, um, so let's say we have like a philosophy of job for life historically. Uh, and we even have a lot of, uh, uh, let's say intercooperation um, issues related with securing job. I mean, we have a, an, an employment fund uh, of our own uh, that is built through uh, the experience of the of the people through the every month you you get uh, you you are detracted some money to, to build this fund we have a relocation rule i mean every company in the every cooperative in mondragon assumes the rule of relocating the people that get unemployed in other companies and of course it has to do with your uh, uh, or how well you're doing in your business. You cannot, maybe you cannot relocate many, but you have to relocate. We have a relocation rule and we have even a relocation office, huh? um, which is like, uh, we have like first level cooperatives that are cooperatives fully owned by workers. And then we have second level cooperatives that are cooperatives owned by cooperatives. Huh? Uh, and let's say the intercorporation is done with this second level cooperative. This unemployment office is a second level cooperative, let's say. So for us, job is security, of course, is something that, uh, um, well, any security, but is also like some kind of equality. We have a, a, a fair pay, uh, policy. We have a one to six a scale, or one to seven to, in some cooperatives. That means that the uh, the lower salary uh, or the higher salary cannot be more than seven times the lower salary, not just even the mean salary, but the lower salary. Okay. Uh, but we also have the this rule of participation. I mean, work for us is a uh, is a way of participating in your uh, in the in the life of the company. We have a one person, one, one boat rule uh, to make the, the main decisions in, the, uh, in each cooperative. I'm sorry. Uh, and, and of course, it's, it's not just participation also, but it's also meaning. I mean, for us, work is a way of uh, transforming our, um, our society or contributing to the transformation of society. So uh, we, we really think that job is uh, uh, a main source of meaning or security of um, uh, getting a decent pay or participation activity or even personal development you know? and since then okay our main let's say one of the our main goals here or main challenges is that the uh, 
we are working, we are companies working in a free market, in the world market. So we are bound to all the pressures, competitive pressures that any company can have. So uh, we have like um, very big companies in the corporation. We are roughly, uh, nowadays we are 80,000 people around the world. Um, but we got one of the main companies, 11,000 people just collapsing in 2013, which was like uh, a real shock for us. No? And that's rising unemployment. And okay, we, we realized that with acceleration of the economy of the competitive uh, pressures on digitalization, automatizations, we, we have uh, uh, businesses that appearing and disappearing all the time. We cannot secure the job of anyone, but we must secure the employability of everyone. I mean, we must build some kind of security net for each one to feel that the future, even though we have robots or we have uh, digitalized all the uh, many processes, they have a place in this future. And so my main goal now is to, to work at three levels. At company level or cooperative level, we want to achieve some kind of um, anticipation of what is going to be the uh, skill shortages on, or skill surpluses that we may have. So we have some kind of people planning, uh, just trying to anticipate the uh, the future. Then we have a personal level. A personal level, what we what we want to achieve is that anyone can be like an active actor of his own reskilling or his own. So um, giving the data that will give you give him give each person information about uh, himself and so so build some kind of awareness of what is his employability situation what are the opportunities that he might find um, in in his company or in other companies or in the labor market even in the open labor market um, and how to build some kind of pathways how he, he can be active um, building his own pathway so, and, and this level is, is very important for us and then we have a third level which is an ecosystem level we are an ecosystem of companies but also we have a university with 5,000 students we have 15 research centers and and we want to have some kind of intelligence system that will help us uh, fill or, or fill or our let's say um, competencies or skill shortages and and to be much faster in relocating people in the in the in the place where they really feel they want to be, you know, given these opportunities, and well, that's all. I don't know if I, I to my time and, and five minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Nico. This is this was useful because what we are going next before we go down to to business on data systems and uh, is actually asking uh, our audience from what they've heard from you, the kind of the series, the spectrum of applications, issues, potential, uh, what is actually the audience expectation in terms of uh, what areas of SDG 8 do you think um, uh, better uh, data sharing can achieve the goal? And uh, take a, a few seconds to think about this. Those are the options on screen. Um, uh, uh, Mansi, would you like to suggest how we find the search? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, you can join in the survey through www.menti.com and insert the code 12706868. Or you can simply scan the code through your mobile phones and you will directly get the uh, uh, get through the uh, survey question. Looks like, yeah, it looks like we have, we have all great expectations, let's say, across <laughs> all dimensions, whether it is um, from full employment, perhaps the obvious one from a job seeker perspective, um, to the protection of labor rights for more um, uh, civil society, civil uh, social justice perspective. Um, so no uh, pressure, uh, panel. <laughs> now you're going to tell us how it works. Um, and uh, thanks, uh, Mansi. Uh, can I start from, uh, from you, Andrea? Um, you explain how the AI Sustainability Center um, addresses the ethical risk of using AI in employment. And of course, you have a direct experience of doing this, that for the Swedish agency. Um, but some of this term may not be, uh, let's say, that, uh, know, that known from ev to everybody. I mean, everybody talks about bias, but can you give us like a, a layman explanation of the kind of risk you've been working on 
um, so that we are sharing this kind of, of context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, and I mean, the, the scope of ethical risks when it comes to using data and AI is pretty broad. Um, but I think for this topic today, the, the most common risk that we're seeing, at least, um, is discrimination. So um, increasing the risk of potentially um, discriminating against certain groups um, that can be based on um, gender, it can be based on, uh, on nationality, uh, language proficiency, various factors, essentially. Um, and like you said, a, a very common uh, root cause for why a risk like that occurs is because you have uh, biased data. I think data bias is one of the most um, talked about pitfalls. Um, most people are aware of it. Um, and you can have bias in your data because of also because of very, um, very many reasons, basically. Um, a really good example um, that I usually uh, like to um, highlight is uh, when a few years ago when a large tech company launched a recruitment tool um, actually with the purpose of increasing diversity um, and this was an ai based um, tool and then once it was launched um, it was discovered that it was systematically recommending men to senior leadership positions um, so in this particular context um, most likely the data that they had trained this tool on was um had historic bias in it um so we know that our society that we live in is biased uh, and that we have systemic biases yeah in our society and so naturally the information that reflects society could also represent that bias um so most likely the training data set had um looked at historical recruitment and then yeah, most likely men were recruited to those senior leadership positions. So when you train AI on a, on a data set like that, you risk reproducing those types of those types of biases. Um, so it's very much about dis discovering what type of the uh, what type of bias you you don't want. You're always going to have some bias, and in some cases, that's even um, you might even want bias. Um, but in this particular context, they did not want the type of gender bias they had. Um, and uh, as a result of not filtering that bias out, um, the company actually had to uh, um, pull the tool off the market. So you could say that that investment was kind of unsuccessful, um, but discrimination is one risk. Um, there are, of course, others. Um, privacy intrusion is also um, quite common when it comes to um, AI in employment, um, particularly because you, um, most often a prerequisite for using AI is having large amounts of data. And um, the more data you have, the more the risk of privacy intrusion increases. Um, and like um, we talked about in the large session before we broke out into these breakout sessions, there are lots of technologies, lots of methods for uh, dealing with privacy, um, privacy risks. Um, so you shouldn't be afraid of of dealing with large amounts of data uh, you should just be mindful that 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 is a risk um, so from a consumer perspective or from a individual job seeker perspective in this case it could be also be that it's difficult to know when you're opting into sharing certain amounts of data it could be difficult to know how that data can then be combined with other data points and combining those two applying ai on that joint data set you could end up with insights that I, as a job seeker or as a consumer, feel um, is, is too pr private. Um, so there's kind of an um, information asymmetry uh, there also. Um, but I'd say uh, discrimination, privacy intrusion, lost autonomy is also a risk um, that we're seeing quite quite often. That point of view, in a way, um, uh, an environment where organizations share data almost sounds like a direct solution, or at least one of the possible direct solutions, because if bias can be created by a bit of a monotonous view of, of some phenomena, uh, you bring together to the table the same observation, but from multiple standpoints, and voila, perhaps you solve some of the bias. Uh, um, and also the point you made about uh, uh, privacy preservation techniques, uh, it, that will enable sharing more because they yeah. part of that resistance is even just in letting your data out because you never know where it's going to end up with and once the data is out mm. there's no way to take it back so 
uh, it in a way it takes us already in that direction. And and can I ask uh, Eckhart also to, to help me with something that as we prepared for this session, you named a few a bit more sophisticated topics with relation of uh, use of AI that can be relevant to um, to our topic. I believe you talked about algorithmic collusion, or algorithmic drift. Can you can you give me a, a, again a five minutes explanation of that if I'm not asking for too much? Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether I can do it in five minutes, but I will kind of try to be as concise as possible. No, I mean, I think for me, you know, the biggest risk is always the ones that we actually don't see and that we don't have on our radar screen. So when I, when you know, most people talk about uh, discrimination and privacy and uh, and bias, etc. And I would say, you know, that's not really surprising. I mean, society is discriminatory. That's why, I mean, that's why organizations like ours exist. Uh, and that, that we find that in the data, in a sense, you shouldn't be surprised. Actually, we ask the algorithms often too much, you know, as, as, as Andrea was just explaining with this example. Uh, I, I can mention the company, by the way, it's Amazon. <laughs> just so, um, and no, it, I mean, if you see these con companies trying to use that and then figuring out, oh, actually, the data is not correct. That's, you know, that shouldn't surprise us so much. And I think uh, being aware of it is obviously good. But there are many risks, you know, where we don't really kind of have this properly on the radar screen. And one of them is what I always um, kind of insist on a lot is, uh, and you mentioned the, techno the, the technical term algorithmic collusion. So what is meant by this? Uh, it's simply saying that when you, when you deploy these, uh, these algorithms at scale, meaning you have several companies using them, and you feed this, these algorithms with the data of what does the market pay for different uh, uh, skills or different uh, workers, etc., you will end up these algorithms being learning about their competitors and using that information to offer basically just a bit more money to kind of attract that person to your company. Yeah? And so, so in a, in a, in a normal in a competitive market environment, that's not what you would expect. You know, you, you would expect that, you know, you basically um, there is somehow the company is kind of accepting whatever market rate, uh, wages out there, whereas this type of algorithm and learn about, about each other's behavior over time and start kind of underbidding in a sense what the or what the optimal uh, wage would be on the market and to create actually a bias and a discrimination if you want but not individual in, in discrimination at the level of of the labor market overall in favor of companies and uh, against against workers uh, and we, these, we do see examples of this it's not it's not a made-up example that i'm giving you we do see examples of this in the real world uh, and so, so this the kind of things that people don't really un uh, look at it because it's something that is actually hard to identify. It's often not something you, you can see in the because there's nobody, there's no, there's no algorithm that's not communicating with each other. There's not somebody picking up the phone and saying, "Oh, let's let's uh, let's offer this type of wages for our uh, for our hires." Um, and so it's actually difficult to identify. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the market is not functioning uh, uh, effectively. The other example uh, on the other term you used was, was algorithmic drift. So what is algorithmic drift? It's basically saying that, and this is where, where kind of discussions on future work is really important. It's basically saying that as, the, as the, our economies evolved, as we kind of move forward with some new technologies, new ideas, we want to address, uh, uh, address, for instance, climate change. We want to address, as, as Andrea was mentioning, uh, discrimination, etc. These algorithms are trained on uh, historical relationships. And so they're no longer relevant. And often what you, what you and, and that's actually something which is a problem for companies. So you start hiring on the basis of these, of these algorithms uh, against an objective that's outdated. And you don't realize it because the data, the algorithms there, you take it on, off, either you take it off the shelf or you basically some consultant comes in and implements it for you. But you don't realize that the algorithm is actually no longer relevant for you. Huh? And so I think, yeah, this is the kind of problem that uh, we, we have to look into this, this, uh, um, these issues constantly and try to catch up in, in a sense with these technologies to understand where the real tricky issues arise. And, what, and I think especially like I'm now I'm talking from a policy making perspective, for policy making it's often really hard to, you know, to, first of all, identify the problem and then second, to be able to, uh, to uh, locate the solution for that and kind of implement it in such a way that it's actually, actually effective. So that's why I said. I mean, I think for I think there are only hard problems in, uh, with this with uh, with our uh, um, data and algorithmic uh, societies, and I think and then identifying this and that's why we have this discussion today is really important to move forward and to make sure that we make the best use of it because that we can uh, use these algor uh, algorithms in a, in such a way that it helps us to uh, promote better solutions for our societies. But that's why we need to be aware of the, the problems and the potential downsides.
Thank you. Thank you, Akkad. And, and, and so far we discussed about employability in a way from a almost computational point of view. Like uh, if we, to achieve perfect employability, we would just need to find out the right algorithm and that perfect data coming in. But there's another element in the picture that are humans, right? That, that we, are, we are a bit strange as, as phenomena, as uh, things moving in this machine. Uh, Inigo, can I, can I rely on your experience to remind us all of, of all of the soft elements of this picture? So uh, how easy or difficult it is to actually have good visibility of uh, your colleagues, in this case, your, your partners, uh, experience, skills, do they feel comfortable sharing the data? So even if we had perfect visibility of your colleagues and, and what their aspirations are and what their weaknesses are, um, could we actually calculate the perfect job for them? What, what is stopping uh, you from achieving this, uh, this objective? Uh, well, it's not an easy question, but well, for uh, in our experience, then um, as I'll tell you before, we want to act at three levels. The, uh, the first level is at company level, at cooperative level. Um, um, but, but before that, I mean, uh, one of the sentences that I, that I love is like something like co-creation starts with a shared perception of risk and potential pathways. No? I mean, and for us being, a, a, let's say, a bottom-up corporation, not a top-down corporation in which the, uh, the, uh, the orders from the corporate center are just uh, deliberate. No, this is not our case. No? The cooperatives attach to uh, different initiatives in a free way. I mean, they can say from a corporate initiative, they can say, well, OK, I, I'm, I'm not sharing this. I'm not sharing my data and not sharing the my information uh, because whatever reason it is. And one of these reasons is creating some kind of narrative that is is common to us. I mean, uh, for us, building this, this narrative is is key because otherwise you go all the way through the uh, through the through the path and uh, um, invest in technology. Start with uh, how are we going to share uh, the uh, information about ethical issues, about whatever it is, and then you come up that the participation is very low or anecdotal. And then so building meaning of what do we do this for. Uh, at company level and at personal level, it's also very important. I mean, we found that we have in our unemployment uh, office, we have some kind of 600 people, roughly, more or less, entering and exiting the, the uh, employment office. Um, and we found that the, the, the ones that are more needed for orientation and support are the ones that are less active on that. I mean, if you are quite skillful or you feel quite confident in your future, then, then, then you are much more open uh, to, um, uh, to validate your skills against some kind of, uh, um, uh, let's say, evaluation tool or um, evaluating your competencies or sharing uh, in a much more open way. So the, uh, the main concern we, we found in many, in, in many people that are really living uh, long-term unemployment, that they don't feel confident, they, they don't feel that they will be successful in reskilling themselves or learning new abilities or getting relocated in a new situation. So uh, for us building some kind of um, purpose for them uh, is very important. And, and building in their self-confidence and, and, and finding ways of uh, learning and exposing to, to, uh, to, to, to the public or to the evaluation processes that um, really uh, protect their, their privacy and their, their uh, let's say, all the fears they may have of being like observed by someone that is judging them as not able or uh, um, with low skills, let's say. And this is the, the most important issues that we, we found at personal level, at the company level. So the whatever we design, whatever solution we think of must address the point you described. We, we may have the perfect algorithm. If you don't make uh, job seekers and workers comfortable in sharing their situation, their visibility, their aspiration, their weaknesses, we will have data that is so limited or partial that even the perfect calculation won't create the solution. Um, and also it reminds me from what you say, how, how good we need to be in communicating that narrative. If the workers we are trying to support don't, don't feel that they're being helped, 
but I feel they're being probed, right? To understand, oh, well, what am I going to fire next, right? <laughs> they, of course, will feel that they need to protect themselves rather than, uh, let's say, open up, expose themselves to the perfect information that could perhaps help them finding uh, their next occupation. And that actually reminds me of Andrea, because you're, you're from uh, Sweden. Uh, and, and I believe in your country, without banalizing this, there's a lot, there's a good relationship between citizens and government, right? Uh, and uh, I'm Italian, so I cannot really say the same thing. Uh, can, can you, can you uh, tell me to what degree do you think it is important in that kind of background that the trust you have in government, in the system, um, what role does had, uh, that, that has in uh, getting the people to open up and to, to give us information that can create that employability? Mm. Yeah, and I think it, it's a really valid question. And, and like you said, in, in Sweden, typically we have a really high trust in public institutions. Um, and so, and I work a lot with public agencies and, and public authorities. So I hear a lot also from the inside how concerned these agencies are with keeping that trust, with preserving that trust. That is at the top of everyone's agenda. Um, and like you said, having that type of trust also enables more data sharing. Um, because I, as a citizen, feel more comfortable in giving up the information because I know that the services I get in return, they are fair, they're transparent about how they're using my data. They can explain the decisions they took on based on that data, et cetera. There are lots of considerations. And I think that's um, the essence here. So um, yeah, so they're very um, very concerned with, with preserving the trust um, and in order for citizens to, to keep on um, sharing data, keep on opting in, um, they need to, for one, take action and actually implement the, um, the strategies, the methods, the tools for, uh, if it's privacy, we're talking about preserving privacy. So maybe then looking at those privacy enhancing techniques or, um, or other solutions, but making sure that they have systems in place um, that addresses the risks, basically. Um, and then finding a, a good balance of communicating around that. So also being transparent about the precautions they're taking to, um, in this case, protect citizens' privacy. Um, and there's a fine balance there also um, on how much to, how much information to share, um, because that can, like in the negative um, perspective, that can also be gamed against them. Um, but, but being transparent, uh, communicating about the precautions they're taking, um, communicating about how data is being used, and also making sure that the services that citizens get in return are um, of high quality, that we as citizens feel that we're being treated fairly, we can, we understand how our data was used. Um, those are our success factors um, that we've seen so far. And, and with communication, I guess, also comes some degree of education and, and the because some of the stuff we're talking about is actually complicated and we don't have, say, an Eckhart to pull out of the of the drawer and say, Eckhart, please explain Drishna. Uh, so uh, thinking of you, Eckhart, actually, because I remember you raising this point when, when we talked the last time, uh, to some degree, uh, we also need to help our colleagues working in employment, the, the HR departments and so on, to understand what's happening here. So most of what we are discussing is very relevant to them. They will be more and more supported by algorithms or AIs in, in choosing, selecting, evaluating CVs for, for job openings, uh, reskilling. Do, do you think we're doing enough, Eckhart, to, to help our colleagues to, to get that right? Are, are we creating some kind of a disconnect between technology going so fast and, and us humans staying a bit behind? No, I think, I think the big problem really is that we don't ask the right question about where can we apply these tools in a way that it helps societies. You know, I mean, as Andrea said, imply, uh, or you mentioned as well, uh, applying these tools to, to monitor and survey uh, people in, at their workplaces, that will create a lot of backlash. And people just will kind of manipulate the, the, the way that they're being monitored. They will try to avoid it, they dutch the, the system, et cetera. And so in the, at the end of the uh, game, nobody really wins from this. Huh? Uh, similar hiring, C, hiring CVs or hiring people on the basis of uh, automated CV selection process 
is bound to give you extremely poor results uh, and not least because it's actually difficult to identify what is the right CV that for uh, what is the person that fits into a particular team and I mean you are you are in this business you know exactly what I'm talking about it's it's actually you can you can identify the correct skills that somebody technical skills that somebody had uh, by, by uh, automatically analyzing them. but identifying whether this person will fit in the team is almost impossible and there, there are actually kind of underlying reasons for that why it's impossible but what is what is possible, and I think where also we as policy institution don't do enough of a, of a job is we can help people to identify what are possible pathways in the in their in their labor markets in their careers, etc. I mean, one of the reasons on one of the results from this from the survey that you just ran before was that for young people it's actually a great possibility to have this type of tools to identify what are the of different options, what are the different possibilities, where are, where are possible career pathways that don't lead to dead end jobs. Huh? And I think here, private and public, uh, uh, sorry, private and public partners need to work much more closely together because we do have a lot of public data as well that is useful. And some institutions like Nesta in the UK, for instance, has, uh, have exploited that already and kind of building tools, uh, recommended tools, for individuals saying, yeah, this is something great, this is some possibilities for you to kind of move on, kind of try to identify what kind of skills you need, what kind of uh, training institution would help you to acquire these skills, etc. The, the labor market becomes more and more complex. I mean, I think that today there was a study for, the, for Germany. I think the German university system offers something like 21,000 different opportunities. I mean, how do you how do you identify what, what you can uh, what what's your future career path? And you have no idea. Huh? I mean, essentially. Yeah? And so I think having this type of recommender tools, kind of getting through the complexity of labor markets and, and helping us to anticipate a bit better where we can go. That's where I see the biggest value of these tools. But that means that we have to maybe kind of look a bit beyond our narrow vision about applying this to individual companies and really collaborate as, as an ecosystem, as a data ecosystem together to, uh, to make these, these tools a uh, reality for everybody. Thank you. And, and this also, in a way, connects nicely, at least in my head, with something Inigo said earlier. That is, so we, there's this component of uh, education, information narrative, uh, technology getting better, but Inigo reminded us that in the end, we also need the job seekers, the workers to take responsibility for their own development. And, and it's not secondary to anything of what we described until now. Um, Inigo, can you, can you give us hints, not only for, for, the, for us, but for, for the audience on how we can make our uh, co-workers, our employees, our, uh, to, to, to get more of that responsibility to feel that together with AI is doing great uh, things for us, they also need to drive that process. Um, well, um, I guess that uh, we have like a very special ecosystem uh, which cannot be like uh, exported to anyone. So giving advice uh, like this, uh, um, I think it, it, there are many subtleties that you have to take into account. No? I mean, it's, uh, how can we make, uh, we have a very special ecosystem in which we have some resistances to uh, reskilling. And, and one of them is that we have like super secure future for everyone. No? I mean, uh, we have no incentives for people that feels that there's, uh, they are filling a, um, a job that can be automated in next month, but they don't feel the necessity to to take their own risk or take their own initiative because someone will take care of them. I mean, we already we also have this kind of this kind of profile of people not being active in their own reskilling. Uh, even though we have the resources, we have the orientation people, we give them information. So um, it has to do with this working um, uh, for their own best future. I mean, it's something like uh, building trust that we are making something that that will help them personally in their own future i mean is how can i have a better version of myself huh? and not just be surviving in a, a job that is doing something close to nothing huh? um, but we have this kind of uh, so what we are really working is like uh, trying to give them incentives and trying to give them um, some kind of net to take risks. I mean, we, you can change from one cooperative to another cooperative. 
the cooperatives, the, the donor, the, the same money. My business is running very well, and I uh, and I must go to another cooperative that maybe are um, is doing less well. And I am the owner of this cooperative, so my revenues come with the results of the cooperative also. So uh, there are many resistances to change job many times. So we have to build the some kind of um, initiatives that can give them the right to return to the previous job the right to start their own new business or start a new cooperative. We have um, um, an initiatives to build um, platform cooperatives. Um, for instance, for the last mile delivery, but owned by their own, uh, by their own uh, workers and maybe, or even for um, uh, elderly care cooperatives. And, so many of our workers, maybe they will be very successful in an uh, elder care, um, elderly care sector, but they are working in an industrial cooperatives, very successful with a lot of money, uh, but they, the job is going to be uh, automatized and they are resistant for that. So we must give them, um, of course, information that is first is key. What is it there? We have to give them also uh, incentives to take risks and to learn and to, to give them, uh, let's say, uh, mechanisms to, to get back or to understand very well their fears. That I think that's, that's very important. Uh, also their dreams, um, to put it in a positive way and try to, to figure out how can we move a bit more forward, not just giving them the information, which is already important. Um, I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I believe we actually have a plan. So uh, uh, five minutes to go, but um, actually I would ask uh, Mansi to put on screen the second question for the audience. While I try to, let's say, put together everything in my head, because very likely our host, uh, Pierre, will ask me to summarize what we said in this session when we come back to uh, the plenary. In the meantime, for the audience, um, check this question from uh, uh, Mansi. Please, uh, Mansi, tell us where to find it for the ones who were not with us at the beginning. So we have another question for you. Uh, we appreciate your uh, participation in the last question. You can simply scan the code from your mobile phones, else you can use the code through menti.com, uh, which is 5705413. Yep. So who would benefit the most from an employment ecosystem that addressed everything we described today? Uh, government, uh, and you can imagine perhaps the need for less social policies, um, less need to intervene with benefits to universal basic income. Uh, perhaps we are going to make it better for intermediaries, like job websites, because they may be exchanging information between them much more easily and seamlessly than we do today. Of course, we may be helping employers uh, because it would be much easier for them to find the right people, and of course, workers themselves, uh, as they would find the new employment. Uh, for them, oh, the intermediaries go up to like crazy. So um, while while uh, you finish answering, uh, let me try to to capture a few messages. So we are all, I believe we are all agreed that we, this, any solutions to SDG eight comes from a combination of uh, technology, whether it is um, uh, data ecosystems, the availability of data itself, uh, and uh, a method to facilitate and make it easier to be uh, sharing in a way that is uh, safe, uh, secure, and, and uh, fair to the people whose data is being shared. But at the same time, there's so much work to do also on the human side of things, making employees and job seekers feel comfortable that can share that information and that there will be a, a fair use of that when it is fed into those algorithms. And we need to help our colleagues work in HR departments and, 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 and skills because they need to understand uh, these powerful tools that are being put in their hands before they create more work for Andrea. <laughs> With all respect, Andrea. I guess your, the ambition of your, of your nonprofit or your organization is that actually you're not needed. Uh, and, and possibly uh, um, all of these, um, as data ecosystem progress and in general, the kind of tools we can use and the education we can, do, we can use. Uh, become a much lesser problem than it is today. I, I see that once again in the survey, we are all very high on all fronts. It feels like there's a lot of work for us to do. Uh, a, a last opportunity for me to thank you all uh, for participating to this session. It will be recorded, so it will be useful to many others who over the next few uh, days or months will catch up 
uh, with what we share. And, and I invite you strongly to, uh, to keep in touch. So there's lots of work we can do together. For the ones of you who did not follow the plenary, there's some reporting we've been doing, particularly specifically to data systems, because we are, we are so, let's say, committed to the topic these days. Uh, I personally was an author to the one you see in the middle, the data sharing masters, that tries to let's say picture what the current situation of data sharing is uh, for employment and not only uh, in business and public sector. So thanks again, all of you.